librarian at I'm a librarian at the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba, Canada. And my name's John Wright uh, from the University of Calgary Libraries in Alberta in Canada. And our, our presentation is Reinforcing Institutional Resiliency Through Multidimensional Library Neutrality, Adapting Theoretical Foundations from Political Science and Urban Planning. We've started, okay. And here's our the founding partner, CJSU. Our presentation is based on an article we recently published in the Journal of Intellectual Freedom and Privacy through ALA. And the article is the role of multidimensional library neutrality in, um, I blocked my screen here, in advancing social justice. Uh, and this is part of their special issue on social justice and intellectual freedom. Our starting quote here is that the answer to illiberalism as we are dealing with things like uh, challenges to library materials and controversial speakers is liberalism. So we're going to be talking about a crisis in public libraries and librarianship over neutrality and intellectual freedom. And this is part of political polarization in general that our profession seems to have lost confidence in neutrality and liberalism more generally, that neutrality is misunderstood and misrepresented in our discourses. We believe that there is a need for strong liberal institutions to mediate conflict. So our approach is starting off with political science theory, looking at libraries, publicly funded libraries as agents of the state. Then we are looking at city planning theory in terms of how professionals as agents of the state interact in the public sphere. So we're proposing a normative framework that we can adapt to librarianship. Specifically, we are looking at two types of neutrality uh, that are practiced in planning or advocated in planning uh, and how they could be adapted to our field in terms of our four-dimensional model of neutrality. Our presentation is we're going to start off with liberalism more generally, look at the role of liberal institutions, libraries as liberal institutions, uh, city planning as a liberal practice, uh, and then our dimension, four dimensional library neutrality model. And then we're going to apply that to the ALA code of ethic number nine, which was uh, passed in 2021. And we're gonna see how our model would change that. So of course, the, the starting point in everything we've said uh, is liberalism. Uh, we're going to assume people are generally familiar with it, uh, but we do need uh, to state what we mean by liberalism. Uh, with regard to that, uh, we're talking about the learned and theoretical liberal principles of contemporary liberalism, uh, individual liberty embedded in or bounded by uh, community realities and social relations, universality, um, the properties of equality, egalitarianism, et cetera, uh, and placed within cultural contexts, pluralism as a mechanism of uh, adjudicating and getting along, and uh, for lack of a better way, putting it post-enlightenment reason, um, shared means of evaluating truthfulness, determining desirability of action, uh, and of course, political science and planning is a part of that. Um, if we compare uh, illiberal means, uh, a lot of illiberal proposals out there in this age of uh, polarization, as we described it, uh, we've got some examples here, uh, compare and contrast, I think it's quite straightforward. Liberalism tends to be incremental reform through institutions, illiberalism tends to call for more re revolutionary changes or dismantling structures. Uh, liberalism is dialogue compromise, illiberal values tend to be censorship, cancellation, no debate, winner take all, et cetera, et cetera. I won't get into them all, they're here in the slide. And uh, we like this as from Counterweight Magazine uh, because it cuts to the core a lot of what we're gonna talk about, which is we define liberalism as a conflict resolution mechanism, not a political ideology. It's a system that allows us to disagree without turning to violence or authoritarianism. So the context here, of course, is the debate in our profession over library neutrality. Uh, a lot of the critical librarianship uh, literature deals with this and whether we should be more interventionist. 
In terms of our institutional context, the ALA's Library Bill of Rights, which goes back to 1939 and has been adapted uh, ever since, the, the basic idea here is that libraries should provide materials representing all points of view and should not be prescribed or removed because of partisan or doctrinal disapproval. And that meeting rooms should be available on an equitable basis, uh, regardless of the beliefs or affiliations of the groups requesting their use. The ALA Code of Ethics as well uh, asks that we distinguish between our personal convictions and values and that we don't allow these to interfere with our work and the aims of our institutions in dealing with information users. So, but we do have this debate then regarding uh, meeting rooms, regarding collections with illiberal challenges from across the political spectrum. And as we're gonna talk about today, book ban requests are up significantly in both Canada and the United States. What do we do about this? Do we intervene heavily, i.e. pick a side, or do we trust in our processes? An example of picking a side and abandoning neutrality is in the 2021 resolution to condemn white supremacy and fascism as antithetical to library work, which asserts that a, what is phrased here as a misplaced emphasis on neutrality has upheld white supremacy. And we argue in the article that this, this is an assertion. Uh, but there's uh, no evidence to support that. Um, that abandoning neutrality is seen in the literature uh, as a need to intervene explicitly in the intellectual and cultural lives of our fellow citizens. Um, and so that, that is an illiberal idea as well. Our starting point for the need for library neutrality uh, is diversity that we live in a multicultural, multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual, multi-faith society with all kinds of competing value systems. And so the library as an institution, librarians as actors can't presume to impose a single ideology or set of values on that society. So um, that, of course, is a background. This leads us more to the theoretical aspect of uh, political science and urban planning. We'll just do a quick lead through on that. Um, why political science and urban planning? Well, of course, naturally, that's our interests and backgrounds. Uh, but both are concerned with theoretical and practical reason uh, and all planning. And uh, that be that physical planning of space or library program planning is political. Uh, planning, certainly from public institutions, is a function of government. Planners cannot implement plans outside of that government function. And together, both uh, political science and planning manage, guide and manage social change. And when we talk about social change, coming to the root of the problem, what we're really, the issues that really bedevil us are wicked problems. Uh, wicked problems resist simple formulations. We give the example of homelessness. It has no single cause. Um, it's symptoms. It's usually symptomatic of other problems. Some of them are equally wicked. Um, there's a no stomping rule. You can never say a wicked problem is resolved. It comes back, it mutates, it changes, it adapts. Um, but at the same time, every intervention counts. Changing underlying conditions uh, helps mitigate uh, a continuing wicked problem, certainly for, for the people who are um, involved or suffering from it. Uh, and wicked problems also tend to be unique, a unique constellation of understood things. So best practices are not necessarily uh, transplantable. And of course, lastly, the planner has no right to be wrong uh, because of the consequences. In other words, um, the unforeseeable outcomes and long-term impacts are there. And uh, again, uh, wicked problems cause harm. Why political science? Um, certainly we assert that librarians are not trained or educated appropriately for political or public policy analysis. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, librarianship itself has little, if any, endogenous theorization. Uh, it appropriates import, uh, importations as required from other disciplines. Uh, library theory and praxis focuses on practical information and people management, best practices, uh, not institutional or other theorizations. This Holly quote from 2003, I think, sums it up quite well. 
The prevailing style of LIS discourse uses techno administrative language to address technical and managerial problems. Most professional literature describes applied research into information literacy. Uh, political science theory itself, uh, of course, is rich in institutionalization, institutionalism, democracy, social justice. It's very well theorized. This is the, the bones of political science. Um, and yet libraries themselves are public institutions, yet librarians and I will say political scientists don't often if ever theorize librarians within the lens of institutions rather than information managers. Uh, the nature and role of the state rather than individual actors and differences in understandings between professionals and non-professionals in the role as institutions, actors in liberal democracies, that there might be differences. Um, I always like this quote, it's from a former professor of mine, um, about the role of theory, you know, he said, if you think the state is an abstract concept, try knocking the hat off a policeman. Um, these theoretical things do get manifest as real things like policemen. So we're gonna talk about state theory because we're talking about agents of the state. And in the 1980s, Dunleavy and O'Leary did an interesting study where they discounted or ignored, in fact, they surveyed, all different kinds of ideological understandings of state, different kinds of states. And, and they came back and they said, it doesn't really matter uh, what the ideology says. So there's a common set of conceptualizations on how the state itself is operationalized as a socio-structural agent. Um, and these three categories is said common across all state theory is the cipher view, which views the state as an empty arena within which competing agents uh, act out and buy for power, something most people are familiar with this. Then there's a guardian state where institutions, government agencies, for example, have their own agency, usually guide, guided by some form of uh, professional standards and ethics. And then there's a partisan state where institutions have directive leadership and or authority, and outcomes are secondary to the need for a dominant state to resolve intractable problems, which is a long way of saying the authoritarian, tendency towards authoritarianism in that last one. And we will advocate for an argument for neutrality based on this guardianship model. In perceiving the state, it becomes important to understand that the public tends um, to look at electoral politics through a cipher framework, uh, if they think about uh, the state at all in the way we're talking about. They, in other words, agencies of the state, public library boards, university boards of governors etc are democratically directed and their policy outcomes should shift according to electoral outcomes or majority will for libraries librarians and librarians have have traditionally and officially adopted a guardian role the ala bill of rights that traditionally espouse strong and repeated messaging about the strict neutrality uh, of themselves and the provision of information and services that's a professional ethics uh, backed by professional judgment or competencies the margins of debate for uh, library workers are in providing information and social need. They don't expand uh, into the electoral politics, except to say, you know, we're professionals. So there, there's a tension between these perceptions, and sometimes they're not well thought out. Um, obviously, the public and professional competencies, and we see this more and more in polarization, uh, are in conflict with each other. Uh, but now there's also a growing tension within our profession on what the nature of professional responsibility, what the response means. Um, and these tensions represent, represent an absence of understanding the roles of professional balance and perpetuating the library as an institution uh, and as an instantiation of a generalized public interest or public good, uh, and a lack of acknowledgement of the agency autonomy and responsibilities of other groups and institutions, things we call stakeholders, other uh, public institutions, etc. Within the profession, tendency has become uh, impatient to impose um, a partisan agency based on conflating guardianship with vanguard lead leadership to address wicked problems. Um, and without the profession, as to say outside, the tendencies also become partisan, eschewing public policy experience for raw arena politics, a winner takes all. And, and this, of course, is what we're seeing play out in things like book bans and library board takeovers and battles and things like that. So we think to be resilient, you need a proven model of engagement over time. 
Um, and you need a mechanism, you need to understand and then create a mechanism to operationalize how state agency uh, can build a participatory model that respects and resolves these perception conflicts, these tensions, fulfills democratic functions and constitutional legal accountabilities, respects our professional competencies uh, while putting liberal democratic boundaries on them, placing them within the context of, of culture and community, et cetera. Um, and binds all participants to a common commitment of participation in common enterprise. Uh, in other words, something that continues to build and rebuild and strengthen pluralistic liberal participation and in our liberal institutions. Right, so what then do we do to develop such a model of engagement? We propose that uh, urban planning, modern urban planning provides a very useful model specifically regarding practitioner neutrality. When we're talking about urban planning, we're really referring to planning following the Second World War, the beginning of the modern planning profession, which began as a very technocratic exercise into addressing urban problems, uh, analyzing the situation, designing interventions, and evaluating. And it's all about working for the public interest. And in the uh, planning literature, we see that it's really difficult to address these so-called wicked problems to everyone's satisfaction because each constituency, the stakeholder groups in the community will have their own aspirations and their own values. So in that sense, there is no unitary public good, but there is a shared public interest in democratic processes. Planners are committed, they have an obligation to multiple publics, a heterogeneous public, not just a single demographic. And as such, the planner and government can't coerce or convert the public to a goal, however you know, good it is, you know, sustainable cities, green transportation, green energy. Um, it can't be just imposed. These things have to be done incrementally with consultation and so on as the only ethically defensible path to social change in democracies. So this is the ethic that we believe is missing from a lot of the critical librarianship literature that advocates more radical and short-term solutions. In modern planning, we have four major movements. Each has a different view of neutrality that we think are really uh, helpful and informative. Um, first of all is the rational comprehensive planning model from 1945 onwards that really dominated in the early post-war period. And this is purely technocratic, empirical, data-driven. The planner, the planner's values play no role. It, it is seen as being strictly value neutral. No one else's values play a role either because everything is strictly about data. And this resulted in things like vast freeways, demolitions of, pub, of uh, slum areas and public housing, you know, like a lot of the uh, post-war uh, urban blight resulted from this sort of technocratic planning. Uh, and this is really thought of as planning for, you have an elite body of experts who are planning for society. In the mid 1960s, we see a return to more incremental ideas, including advocacy planning. And this idea is that the planner would work with community groups and represent them before planning commissions. And this is I, the idea here is planning with. The planner isn't neutral. The planner adopts the values of the community that they're working with uh, so they can advocate for them. In the early mid 1970s, we see the emergence of radical planning that sees this incremental uh, mode as, as too slow. And this is that the communities themselves are going to be doing the planning and they hire the planner to help them. So this is planning by the community. And the literature, some of the literature warns that the risks with radical planning is that the planner can get so absorbed into the political aspirations of that one stakeholder group that they're no longer able to mediate conflict in the community in general. In the early to mid 1990s, we see another mode emerge of communicative or collaborative planning or planning together in which the planner simply creates an environment, a venue in which all the stakeholders can come together and engage in dialogue uh, and create knowledge together and, and resolve uh, conflict. So what's really important about these models is that we see in rational comprehensive planning, this basic idea of value neutrality that we're calling uh, value neutrality one is that values play no role. 
the planner can be purely objective and everything is about positivism and empirical facts. But in collaborative planning, where the planner works with the community, knowledge is constructed socially. It's all about making sense together while living differently. Here, the planner recognizes that they have values, but they're not going to impose them. They create the dialogic structure to, to, in order to mediate these competing interests. And it's all about future seeking rather than future defining. The planner isn't imposing a vision. And this is what we're calling value neutrality too. Recognizing that all of the processes in the public domain are value laden. And there's always decisions to make about what information to include and what to exclude. The planner is never value neutral. The stakeholders you're working with all represent a plurality of value systems. So the, the public institution can't adopt or impose a single ideological lens and the practitioner can't impose their own personal views on the stakeholders or take the ideology of one stakeholder group and impose that on everyone else. This is what the basis of what we're calling multidimensional neutrality. Now the article we got these four elements from is actually about conflict mediation and bioethics, but it maps out really well on urban planning. What it is is an aspiration to these four different kinds of neutrality. Value neutrality is not imposing values on the community. Stakeholder neutrality is all stakeholder groups are welcome to participate and share their views and listen to others. Process neutrality is that all stakeholders are aware of the rules of conduct. There's transparency. Everyone is treated equally by the process. And there's goal neutrality. That, those goals, the seeking the future is left up to the individuals and the groups involved and respecting the autonomy of everyone involved. So we see here then with these different modes of planning that this, these, um, these four uh, types of neutrality map out rational comprehensive planning has that assumption of value neutrality, but everything else is not uh, neutral. With advocacy planning, they recognize the neutrality of the process, but that's it. In radical planning, ideally the planner shouldn't impose their values, but more often than not, they will adopt the values of the community. So there's no neutrality involved. But in our, our last category, collaborative planning, there is all, all of these elements are met. There's the second form of value neutrality. Stakeholders are treated equally in a transparent process so they can achieve their goals. Now, there are critiques of communicative planning, that it emphasizes process over outcomes. It takes a long time. It may fail to take account uh, of bad faith actors who may want to subvert the process. It may take insufficient account of power relations. It may be very difficult or impossible to reach a consensus in a highly polarized environment. And the planner's own agenda for things like the just city or the green city may be difficult to achieve. But the idea is that if you have this process in place and the stakeholder groups in the community know that it's there and everyone's playing by these rules, that these issues can be dealt with in the long term. So what are the implications then for library neutrality? We believe then that there's a vast difference between the ontological presumption that the institution and practitioner are value free and the ethical recognition that the institution is value laden but there's an ethical commitment not to impose one's values on stakeholders. We feel that most criticism in LIS mistakes this latter ethical form for the former, uh, which, which is you know, hubristic. Um, and so there's this basic confusion. In our model then of dialogical or communicative librarianship, there is an aspiration to neutrality regarding materials, but not to ideas. There's neutrality towards the community as a whole, but not to users as individuals that we will work with for their particular needs. That everyone has a right to access. Nobody has a right not to be offended by content or speakers. And this doesn't involve passivity or moral relativism. This actually involves a lot of work and agentive action on the part of the librarian. So we took all this, uh, obviously in our papers, a lot more detail in the background and we go through it in more detail, um, but we took all this and we applied this approach to the ALA Code of Ethics number nine. 
Uh, and as we say here, the, the differences aren't great. They don't leap at you, out at you off of the page, but we think they're subtle and they're profound because they do focus on process and they remove some boundaries and they place some other things in appropriate boundaries. So if we look at the uh, original ALA code of ethics, uh, we've highlighted where the change is gonna come. We affirm the inherent dignity and rights. Rights are problematic. They're always contested. They're also techni technical and legal. If you get into a rights debate, you're both cutting off avenues of engagement uh, and you're also then moving things into a legal stream where you might have to engage legal services. Just want to back it up there, Michael. We're on the uh, second one on the rewrite. Oh, sorry. So rights is one thing we highlight. Um, we work to recognize and dismantle systemic and individual biases. We, we think that's impossible, frankly. Um, and it's a lot to ask of a library worker. Uh, to confront inequity and oppression, again, we feel that that just puts things, that puts conflict, frontline workers in conflict, where you need to have better structures to deal with things. Uh, to advance, enhance diversity and inclusion, to advance racial and social justice in our libraries, again, those are contestable terms, and advancing them, how, who, why, um, we're looking for, for something slightly different, I think. And communities, again, it highlights it, that we're dealing with communities and, and they have different values. So a lot of this is irreconcilable, actually. So now if we skip to the rewrite, instead, we've said we affirm the inherent dignity and autonomy instead of rights of all library users. That's a stakeholder neutrality. Each user's right to access the collections, which is a goal neutrality, we work to recognize and dismantle potential barriers to access, uh, which are created by social problems. So we're addressing wicked social problems directly um, rather than a rights dialogue. Uh, we work to advance structures and processes that strengthen our profession and our institution's abilities. In other words, every decision is about resilience. Um, and to provide all opportunity, knowledge, education, et cetera, et cetera, which is process neutrality. Uh, and through advocacy, instruction, collaboration, and equitable allocation of resources and spaces, value neutrality too. So we shift things out of a rights, more of a rights debate and into a, how do we make this work and how do we build our institutions. So, you know, library neutrality is a value with not an ontological assertion. It's a commitment to an ethical process and iterative process consistent with liberal democracy. 4D library neutrality recognizes and addresses wickedness of social political problems, recognizes professional boundaries and competencies, affirms process over outcome and a comfort with permanent process. Uh, it would be pluralist and inclusive. Uh, it would be facilitative, communicative, incrementalist, and I believe there's one more to come oriented to long-term solutions at maintaining perverse uh, institutions rather than short-term crisis solutions and single issue solutions. Uh, clarity on this would help harmonize values on democratic public oversight of library and internal professional standards and would help with professional practice and co praxis in context of libraries, liberal democratic institution and nurture the guardian role of the library, and finally, enable communities to plan together. Thank you, everyone. I would like to thank you both for an excellent presentation. Um, I'm so sorry we don't have time for questions. Um, you're more than welcome. To, we can stop the recording, and if anybody wants to stay to ask questions, they're free to do so. It, it's up to you, but I know people um, do want to get off to some other sessions. So I will thank you.